what now, Stu? I'm serious, like... <laughs> to what I believe is the seventh episode of The Mindful Activist. I'm the host of this podcast, and we're broadcasting live on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, so I'm Matt Reddy. I am the founder of the Global Consensus Project, the creator of the HiveOne.net uh, activist uh, platform, social media platform. Uh, what else? And I am also an elected uh, politician. I'm a hospital commissioner here in East Jefferson County, Washington. Um, so uh, today I am very happy to have a good friend of mine, uh, Jale. I, I never say your last name. What's your name? Alma E. Alma E. Yes. So um, a good friend of mine who I never call by her last name. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, so before I ask you to introduce yourself, I was going to introduce you in a, a way I've never introduced a guest before, which is with a little video introduction, which they can, they'll see a little bit of on our giant screen here. Um, so this is, uh, this is a little video from the day I met Jale, which was uh, several years ago back in during the Occupy movement, and let's see how well this works. You know, I might have to like, I'm not sure it's fair to them to really be showing, but, but if you can see this, this is, no, <laughs> it doesn't look like they can see it very well, <laughs> but uh, we have Jale in a police outfit, and you'll at least get to hear some of it. Are we gonna make it? Are you kidding me? I got kids at home. I'm gonna have to find more childcare. That sucks. How's your shoulder? My shoulder is killing me. Well, when we uh, take him down, let me do the heavy lifting. Just back me up, please. All right, I'll go, Sean. Take him down. When we edit this together, we're gonna like. <laughs> we'll show it. Oh, we're doing it direct action. What's going on? Come over here. Hey, come join us. 
All right, so when this is spliced together, it will actually show the video on the screen. You'll be able to see it well. But this is a, uh, a performance of, or a, mm -hmm. a performance award of the Poetic Justice Theater Ensemble, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you, per you were a participant that day in that performance. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to that. Um, and so I did, that was when I first noticed Jale existed in this universe. <laughs> but then, after that, Oh, it's sort of a shame this video doesn't show up. Maybe I'll just show the pictures. So, no, that doesn't, they don't really see that here. But there's a big, if you could see this, there is a big tent in front of Bank of America and a bunch of people here that outside protesting. That was actually a really great action. It, well, it yeah. was. It was. Yeah, it was for a, those who don't know Port Townsend, it's a pretty small town on the Olympic Peninsula, and there was a really big turnout to basically occupy Bank of America and the Poetic Justice Theater Ensemble, which I'm a member and trainer of, um, a program of the Mandala Center for Change, which I'm the co-director. We showed up to do a public performance um, as known as a forum theater project, which essentially invite invited people on the street who were watching to come step in and replace the character they saw struggling. And the little play that we did, which was just about five minutes long, was essentially a play about police brutality. Some protesters peacefully singing and linked arm and these two police officers, myself. That we can use the, the internet um, which has connected the world in ways that it's never been connected before, you mm -hmm. know, in, um, in the history of humanity. The last 50 years, we have suddenly created a world where um, people all over Earth can communicate and connect and potentially start making decisions together um, in a way that it was never possible before. Mm -hmm. And I think if we start, if we figure out a way to do that better, then um, we actually can just sort of start creating a... Uh, a human decision-making matrix or structure that is uh, completely new, completely mm -hmm. separate from these power pyramids that are all over Earth. Mm -hmm. um, we can create this really broad uh, decision-making power structure that could have a lot of influence. You know, not necessarily tearing down these other pyramids of power, but um, maybe uh, actually able to tell these pyramids of power what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if there was um, say in the U.S., if everyone or the vast majority of the people in the U.S. were actually um, connected online and able to really, instead of relying on uh, polls, you know, currently that's how politicians, they stand up there in their power position, they, they let the CNN or whatever do a poll of a thousand people on mm -hmm. some major issue, and they say that somehow tells them what the country wants, mm -hmm. and they use that as a way to, to convince people people that they're listening to the country. But what, sure. if, what if everyone in the US, instead of a thousand people, actually a million people actually just said what they wanted and mm -hmm. they were able to do that um, uh, quickly, not mm -hmm. like a poll every few weeks, but mm -hmm. like every day, they could just say what they wanted and mm -hmm. they were communicating. It'd be very, very hard for the leaders to ignore that. To, sure. it would, instead of these polls being uh, a tool that a politician can pull out when they want to listen to some mm -hmm. poll, it becomes the will of the people is actually like clear and said, and it becomes um, it becomes very very difficult for a politician to just blatantly ignore that and just pay attention to other influences that are trying to get them to do their bidding. Right. So. If it was rendered that explicit, yeah, then yeah. them ignoring it would be a pretty clear indication of yeah. And, and that's one of the things I'm I'm trying to build. Mm -hmm. That's a, one of my projects is. Um, so it's a communication vision and, and a clarity vision, transparency. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to create a, a mass decision-making platform for mm -hmm. millions or billions of people to, um, to do that, to, to communicate and say what they want and um, have it be a reliable and trusted way to get an idea of the will of the people. Mm -hmm. yeah. It seems like we're moving in that direction somewhat, that national identity um, it, it's been such a, a significant part of of politics um, for such a long time 
the whole modern era. I mean, since we've moved away from kind of nation states, I guess, from city states, um, as we've grown into into countries, that's mm -hmm. really dominated politics. Um, but we're slowly kind of drifting beyond that. I know there are polls that have been that have been talking about polls, but mm -hmm. <laughs> focused upon upon young people in particular and and their sense of identity politically is is much more global now they don't think of themselves as primarily u.s citizens or, or english citizens or french citizens or whatever it might be that they think of themselves as citizens of the world so that that trend is is even translating into how people think of themselves yeah mm -hmm. yeah i actually think um i think in a way it's inevitable I think um, uh, I think potentially technology. I mean, it, we're the only technological civilization we know about mm -hmm. humanity. But um, if we could study, you know, I can imagine different technological civilizations on other planets or mm -hmm. throughout time. It it may be inevitable that they develop a technology that connects everyone on the planet, mm -hmm. which over time really wears away the concept of whatever nations or tribal, you know, mm -hmm. situations they created in their early history and eventually it becomes a very global identity. Sure. Although I imagine if we like colonize Mars mm -hmm. and, or the moon, those will probably end up being the new, you know, I can imagine pretty big identities being revolved around your planet. Yeah. You know, the Planetary Earth identities. Versus, right? yeah, yeah, Martians <laughs> versus <laughs> lunars. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> But we're nowhere near that. Right. <clears throat> I think a lot about, um, about community. That's, that's a big part of my kind of professional life, but it's a big part of, um, of how I think about things, how I perceive things generally you know, on, a, on a broader level. So you know, what, what you're talking about essentially is creating kind of a global community. And maybe that already exists. So kind of harnessing that and expanding it maybe in, in, in some directions. Yeah, but yeah, it, it yeah. is, <clears throat> you know, with uh, the social media networks, mm -hmm. you know, Facebook right now being, um, Facebook and Twitter, I suppose, being the, mm -hmm. the two biggest, um, uh, those are the beginnings of mm -hmm. a potential global community, but they are, you know, in places like Reddit and YouTube, um, but they're not made to the the, the people that uh, the architects of it. Mm -hmm. They they're they're not motivated by trying to make the world a better place. Primarily, mm -hmm. I mean, they're corporations. They are motivated to to serve the interests of their shareholders, which is to make more money. So it's um, so I don't think we're gonna we're gonna get out of corporate profit motives mm -hmm. um, the type of platform uh, that really connects. Humanity in the way, um, in a way that um, really serves the mass population's interests. Mm -hmm. It's sure. always going to be a a web of connecting people, and then how can we squeeze this web to get money out of it? And you mm -hmm. know, how can we move, squeeze it, and move the people so that they buy certain things so we can get more money out of it? I mean, that's. Right. Um, so I think it's going to be. I think some sort of open source. Um, and uh, yeah, some sort of open source egalitarian development mm -hmm. system is going to have to come up with a way to to create the platform that really takes humanity where it uh, right. where it could go to have mm -hmm. a much better decision making system. And and maybe it's not inevitable that we get there. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we could probably go a very long time with some very bad you know systems. That uh, things could really go off the rails. Yeah. yeah. And even a good system can be corrupted or, you know, mm -hmm. co-opted by bad actors. Right. So it's going to be an interesting, the next 50 years, mm -hmm. a very interesting time for us. I think that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there, clearly there are a lot of things that are preventing people from being happy. Mm -hmm. These broad things, that some of the things that you were touching upon earlier. You know, torture, op you know, massive oppression. Yeah, basic necessities, basic freedoms. Right, yeah. people not having access to clean water, yeah. access to even rudimentary health care, access to education and other enrichment opportunities. You 
know, real economic hardship where you're living in houses that are tiny and unsanitary. I went to India. There, there was a place where all these houses along the side of a river and they were beaten out of old oil drums. So they took the, the drum, I, I assume they contained oil, I mean, who knows what was in them. Could have been something even more toxic than that. And they were flattened out into sheets and they built these little huts out of them along the river. And they were probably about the size of, you know, half of this studio, the, the whole, and there would be families living in these, in these houses. Clearly, you know, no plumbing, no basic amenities, things that we take for granted in America. I think that's how a lot of people in the world live in, in these conditions that, that we would regard as just horrifically tough. So those things, maybe not always, but, but often would, would get in the way of people experiencing joy. So, you know, a core aspect of your, of your mission, your, your ideology, your vision, what drives you is, is to remove some of these, these impediments. But what, but what is joy? Like, what, what is it that gives you, like, those are the negative things. Those are the things that are standing in the way. Mm -hmm. but, but what is happening? It, it, do you experience happiness? If you just get rid of all those things, if you have all your needs taken care of, you have clean water, enough to eat, shelter, mm. are you then happy? Or does happy have a, a positive component to it? Is, mm. is it something that you actually have to reach for and strive for? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, having your necessities taken care of is, mm -hmm. it's not a, you know, it's not a key, not a guarantee of happiness. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think I think happiness is much more, uh, it's a very subtle thing. And in, 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 um, in, in a way, um, you're really, I mean, you are ultimately incredibly limited to how much you can affect the happiness of another, peeing, another being. I mean, um, if you have, uh, I mean, lots of people have family members who have money, have jobs, uh, but there's so many things that can that can make you miserable, you know, mm -hmm. so many um, addictions or other, or, or fears or, um, or just, you know, the, the desire for love and companionship and not figuring out how to satisfy that. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are, it's almost like there's, um, uh, well, the way I've talked about it is there's an internal world and an external world. Mm -hmm. And in the internal world where you're, where you're, which is, I actually think it is more important than the external world, what's going, and it's really the place that you have the most power. Um, but the internal world, you're largely on your own for how you figure out how to, what will it take to make myself actually feel good about life and feel good about the world. And um, the, the tools and activities you do to try to deal with that are very different than in the external world. And mm -hmm. for me, it's um, it's meditation is is sort of my mm -hmm. my uh, primary tool for sorting through that for um, for exploring that, looking at what's alive in me, what forces are going on, what uh, what things are, feel out of place or um, discontent, and trying to then figure out what do I, can I do or change to. Um, to make myself feel um, feel happier about life, and and really that process is what drew me to activism, and it was, but not in the sense that if I can help everyone on Earth have clean water, it'll make me happy. It was just sort of an extension of the things I was doing that was that were making me happy. Um, a brutal, okay. Yeah, and it's also about connection. You know, it was about. Because uh, I think part of happiness is um, is you see other happy other people that are like maybe not maybe not happy but they're fired up about life and they're doing things that are interesting and then if you you join forces with them or you connect with them you sort of um, it's still almost kind of selfish you're still sort of like feeding off their joy and energy and it's like feeding you but a lot of the people you make doing it sounds so vampiric well sucking the 
I don't, uh, you know, it's very mutual often, you know, I mean, people aren't, yeah, it's a symbiotic thing, but I, exactly, I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with the vampire analogy, you know, it's like, they get a bad rat, yeah, yeah, I mean, you are basically, you're feeding off the energy of others, but I mean, generally, you know, it like, you're, you're giving back, and it's kind of life. Well, I don't really see how that metaphor, <laughs> that part of it, doesn't really. We might just, yeah, we're just a little bit. Although, you know. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yes. One thing that I find positive, you know, something that I've I've thought about a lot is, you know, here we are in this nation that is astoundingly wealthy. Just astonishingly rich, the, the U.S. Um, I, I talk to my daughter about this a lot. I have a, a daughter who's 12 years old, and it's come up frequently. And I've done a lot of traveling to third world. Like I've seen a lot of really severe poverty. So I try to tell her, you know, you live in a really rich country, and you are really rich. You're not rich. You know, we live in a two-bedroom condo. You know, I know people who have these really huge houses and have pools in their backyard. We're not. We're not even remotely rich, you know, we're, we're barely better than poor, is, is her perspective. Um, so I try, to, I try to convey some perspective, like, yeah, you know, there are people who are richer than us in the U.S., but on an international you know, level, we are fabulously rich. And there's even, you know, there's charts you can find on the internet that will gauge your wealth and give you a percentage. You know, internationally, and, and I think we're like in the top one percent of wealthy Just people internationally. So I, you know, I bring this up on my phone, and I show you, look, you're in your top one percent most wealthy people in the world. Yeah. You, know, you need to stop whining Just about there being nothing to eat in the fridge. I'm sure that works really and, well. Yeah, and she's like, oh, this is <laughs> this is just total nonsense. I refuse to believe this. <clears throat> but we are, we're we're, we're astoundingly rich, Just and. Well, and there are people who definitely are not doing well, people who are really struggling. And I, as a police officer, I interact with a fair number of those people professionally. Um, so people who are struggling with really severe mental health and maybe not getting the treatment that they need, or other medical issues. People who really don't have enough to eat, people who are grappling with addiction issues, or children in those households whose parents are grappling with addiction issues. So the, these are real severe problems. But generally, even if you're fairly poor in America, generally you know, you're, you're probably going to have enough to eat. So you're going to have a place to live. Um, you're going to have a fairly kind of clean, sanitary environment. You're going to have access to education. You, know, you, you have these things. So it seems like in the U.S. we should all be like, blissfully happy. Mm. And we have these things. You know, we're living in the promised land. This is the the land overflowing with milk and honey. We have everything. I know. I, you know, I have every, and I, you know, I'm not considered wealthy by American standards, but I have everything I could, I could need. I don't want for anything. <clears throat> Yet it seems like in the U.S. there's an epidemic of misery. <clears throat> yeah. It seems very. It seems rare to encounter somebody who's like, yeah, you know, I'm totally blissfully happy and nobody's going to be blissfully happy all the time but even to encounter people like yeah you know, I'm, you know generally I feel like I've got it really good and, and I'm joyful people, there's so much so many people struggling with with depression and chronic anxiety and why, why it doesn't seem like there's any connection at all between having the wealth and experiencing the joy almost is it? I wouldn't say there's no there's no connection I mean if you don't have the necessities of life you're you're at a massive disadvantage and if you don't you don't feel safe you know, going out of your home or if you are right. if you have violent uh, oppression in your world you've got it's very I can't even imagine how hard it is to you know, have a, a happy life but it seems uh, like but depression then, should be a rarity in well, not depression, because depression is, is a condition, it's a clinical yeah. condition, but being miserable should be, you know, this, this wild exception. I don't, I don't know, I just think yeah. like, life is hard, you know, and it's like, uh -huh. I think it's...
It can give people a structure for how to deal with their internal world and mm -hmm. tell them, well, this is what the meaning of life is, this is what the path is, this is what you should care about, and actually tell them you're happy because you're doing this, this, and this, and you're going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in our modern age, organized religion, at least in the U.S., is, uh, it seems to have um, become, uh, at least for a portion of the U.S., Right. Uh, it's become far less powerful, mm -hmm. and so people are now, uh, you know, now it's it depends what do they use instead of religion to figure out how they navigate this stuff, and how right. do their parents have a way to really teach them how to how to navigate your mm -hmm. internal world? Um, yeah. I mean, there's still a lot of deeply religious people, and there yeah. there's certain parts of the U.S. where a large proportion of the people are, are deeply religious. And there are people who are deeply nationalistic as well. I mean, think of these things, yeah. we were talking about that before. But these are things that provide a lot of identity, a yeah. sense of identity, a sense of meaning in people's lives. And I think, I think you're right that for a large segment of the population, these things are no longer um, relevant. They don't have as much force yeah. as they used to have, or, or no force at all. They're really failing to... But I mean, what it really comes down to, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the challenge of every human life is you have to figure out what's actually important. Right. And you are, have, you might have religions telling you one thing is important. You have maybe nationalistic, you know, people telling you this is what's important. And you have, mm -hmm. you know, every friend, every person you know telling you mm -hmm. what is important. And you have to actually decide mm -hmm. what is important. And... It's, you know, if you're not going to just surrender that, that uh, the authority on that, of that decision to another person or organization and mm -hmm. just say, I'm just going to trust this book or this person to tell me what's important, you're going to take the weight of that on yourself to decide what's important. Sure. Then, I mean, you're, you're at the point every, you know, existential philosopher that's ever lived mm -hmm. in trying to figure out what the heck is life about, right. what's important, what's going to make me happy, and how do I get there? Well, that's the essence of existentialism right yeah. there, is, is that struggle yeah. to generate meaning without relying upon yeah. authority. And a lot of those existential philosophers were not yeah. incredibly happy. No, <laughs> they didn't come across as such. No, no they did not seem, I mean, no. that's why There's I... There's a lot of angst.